The Generator. The Generator. The Generator News. The Generator. The Generator News. It's like selling off our country with inflated prices. It gives us a delusion that we're actually doing well. Energy matters. Living sustainably. A lifetime of war. Climate chaos. Local food action. The computer models used to predict climate chaos have not taken Arctic forest fires into account. A lifetime of war. Marine wash. Energy matters. Sustainable settlement. Local food. The generator. Yes, you are on the generator with me, Jeff Ebbs, and our wonderful, sharp, and intelligent panel, who you'll meet in just a moment. This episode of The Generator is running as part of the Sustainable Living Festival, so welcome to all you sustainable livers. Uh, The star of this episode is my new book for Australian Geographic, so welcome all you adventurers. And the name of the book is Your Life, Your Planet, which you can find out more about at yourlifeyourplanet.com. The book's primary focus is to get to the truth about greenhouse gas emissions, always a great conversation killer, so we'll kick off with an introduction by a very special guest. So special, we've not invited him or even asked him. We've just stolen his very own introduction to his very own Boyer Lectures, which are running now on our very own ABC. This year's Boyer Lecturer is the leading Australian businessman, Dr Andrew Forrest AO. I have a confession to make. The iron ore company I founded 18 years ago, Fortescue, generates just over 2 million tonnes of greenhouse gas every year. 2 million tonnes. That's more than the entire emissions of Bhutan and its 800,000 inhabitants. It's a huge number. Yet it's also just 0.004% of the greenhouse gas that enters the atmosphere every year of around 51 billion tonnes. Yes, it's complicated. So complicated, it's tempting to go into denial. Now some politicians want to label carbon dioxide a pollutant. Imagine if they succeed. What would our lives be like then? Carbon dioxide. They call it pollution. We call it life. Well, not all politicians. This is coal. Don't be afraid. The Don't be scared. The hurt treasurer you. knows the rule on crops. It's coal. Now, you don't have to convince me that the climate's not changing. It is changing. You know, and the other thing is I think we've got to acknowledge is, you know, there's a higher authority that's beyond our comprehension and right up there in the sky. Yes. yes. Well, well, weird, weird stuff, stuff does happen in the sky. Personally, I prefer to nut out the complexity and then make it really simple. The personal carbon target is used throughout your life, your planet, to show your personal emissions compared to people in other parts of the world. Oil-rich nations pump out greenhouse gas, building artificial ski slopes in the middle of the desert. Australia and the US are not much better. And to meet our Paris commitments, we have to remove enough emissions to get down to this line, the target, closer to the average Tongan. Now that's pretty tough, even if you follow every tip in your life, your planet. The answer isn't to stop mining iron ore, which is critical to the production of steel, to humanity. The answer is green, zero emissions energy and steel. And that makes a bigger difference than many of the tips that you might try at home. So, here to talk about carbon emissions, circular economies, and how we thrive in a post-carbon world are me, Chantel. Hello. How Welcome are you? to The Generator, Lee. Thank you. Here's my page in the book, if people are interested. Uh, Lee's an author, speaker, researcher, and director of Viva La Vegan. So, it's true to say a lot of your work these days is to do with digital wellness, is that right? Yes, yes, moved into something new. Okay. Very interesting. Tip 33, turn your phone off at night. Mm -hmm. Uh, Sabrina Chikori, also a researcher and regular speaker, especially on degrowth and post-capitalism and founder of the Brisbane Tool Library. Welcome to the launch show, Sabrina. Thank you. Yeah, I saw that uh, you are the two libraries here. So that's great. Uh, I look forward to read all the other tips. (laughs) Excellent. And Helen Andrew, founder of Spare Harvest and a circular economy consultant, Welcome, Helen. Oh, hi, Jeff. Thanks for having us. And Helen uh, will talk to us in a moment about food waste, 
So here is a quick dive into the topic. What's wrong with the supermarket anyway? It's only a shop. The real question is what's wrong with us? Going to the supermarket when we know full well that it promotes junk food, packaging, food miles, farmer rip-offs, and of course, food waste. I've actually never thought about what happens to my food when I throw it away. In the United States, 40% of the food we produce is going to waste. Food production is the single biggest cause of deforestation, water extraction, biodiversity loss. More and more people are concerned about climate change. And one of the biggest contributors to greenhouse gases is the food that they're throwing away. We are literally taking food out of the mouths of the hungry and sending food waste into landfill. That is crazy. Cool. Thanks, Jeff. So food waste is absolutely a passion of mine, and it came from having an abundance of mandarins on my tree that I actually wasted. So I was growing all this beautiful fruit in my backyard and I wasted it, uh, which posed a dilemma about how to actually get that uh, food into people's hands that were probably very food insecure and they could have been even my neighbours. Food insecurity is a hidden problem um, and food waste is a massive problem and we need to align those better. Your food waste, every time you put something in your bin, you're contributing to greenhouse gas emissions. 8% of greenhouse gas emissions come from food that goes into your bin. It produces a methane gas, which is more toxic than carbon dioxide. So I share with people that if you want to make a difference, um, don't worry about your car and driving your car out of the garage. Look at what you're putting into your bin because when that food goes into the landfill, it actually creates a space where it can't decompose and it leaches methane into the atmosphere and leaches toxins into our groundwater. So please, if you can't eat it, you can't compost it, you can't share it with someone else, find another way of actually um, getting rid of your food waste, share it with your neighbours. That was the whole point of Spare Harvest, to create a way that your individual act actions, if you couldn't do them, you could find someone else in your community to do them with. And it's through our collective response that we were actually able to actually make a difference on food waste. So jump on to Spare Harvest, um, share what you've got spare in your kitchen and your garden, and find someone who can compost your food scraps if you can't. So do it before it becomes waste. Absolutely. Uh, waste is just a resource in the wrong place. Sabrina, would you like to add anything to that? Oh, well, you know, I think that the interesting thing about having this book is to actually, you know, mobilise and activate people and communities around us. And when I started the Brisbane Food Library, for me, starting it was um, a community response to the global, you know, issues that we're facing. And uh, we should acknowledge that the current economic system based on capitalism is very, you know, is the cause of the social and ecological misery that we're seeing around because capitalism has inbuilt is a growth tendency that you know, that seeks always to accumulate uh, capital and resource extraction. So we need to redesign society so that we can live within the planetary boundaries. And, uh, uh, and but the first step I think I really want to highlight today, and probably the book has a lot of solutions, is to acknowledge the problematic system, you know, the, the current uh, capitalist system produces not to fulfill human needs or, uh, you know, ecological needs, but just to sell commodities, you know, to accumulate capital. But the good thing is that alternative exists in the literature, but also in practice, such as economic degrowth, post-growth studies. We try in our little bubble with the Brisbane Tool Library to share resources so that uh, we reduce that consumption and waste uh, going to the landfill. But um, I really invite people well, to read the book and then to explore more which other alternative economic system exists. Beautiful. Thanks for that. Uh, Lee Chantel, you've been thinking about food for a long time. What would you add? Yeah, well, I guess as a vegan for 24 years now, which, you know, sits still here alive, I know, you know, a lot of people doubted that at the beginning. Um, but I think a lot of things like the other ladies mentioned is just being aware of what you're purchasing maybe and um, just using what you need. And I think, you know, for vegans, they, you can be really caught up in buying all the processed and packaged stuff. And sometimes you just have to remember to be a bit more mindful of what you're consuming and what you're purchasing. 
because, you know, you think about the food miles of your favourite products that comes from the US or the UK. Lots of stuff has, you know, um, plastic packaging and some other packaging on top and then you've got the polystyrene, you've got all that stuff as well. You know, not obviously as bad as um, animal, animal products as well, but, you know, you can still do a bit better, I always think. And I guess, you know, with me, with my vegan animal uh, rights activism, and it's sort of what I'm doing now with the more digital um, sort of wellness stuff is more those conscious, mindful decisions. So just pause, consider what you're doing, and then decide if you're taking the right out- outcome. So the packaging, uh, you know, the processed vegan food that you have mentioned, what would you say the best alternative is? vegans well whenever i used to give talks about what do vegans eat um there's the basics you've got your beans and legumes pulses stuff like that fruits and nuts seeds um nuts things like that and your vegetables and they're the basic things like you can i love a meal that's beans greens and grains that's beans, greens and grains yeah that's simple you know Excellent. Well, that's just the food. Let's think for about 12 seconds about the packaging. How to save the planet with the few. Step one. Buy soda stream. Step two. Save up to 2,000 bottles by using one reusable bottle. Planet saved. Well, there you go. It's pretty simple. We can save the planet in three easy steps. Anyone want to make a comment on that? <laughs> okay, so one alternative is to carry in your own water. Yeah, definitely, yep. Yeah. I mean, the whole idea that we can consume our way out of this problem, you've mentioned the need yeah. for degrowth and the problem of a capitalist system that encourages us to spend and consume yeah. and waste. That's a pretty extreme example of um, selling packaging as a solution. Yeah, uh, we're destroying the planet because of convenience. Because yeah, of convenience. A strong thread. Yeah, in the, yeah exactly. and I'm actually doing my PhD on you know food systems and food packaging and convenience plays a, a important role. But it's interesting to understand what that convenience means. You know, I feel that this uh, under the social pressure of the system, we don't have time anymore to grow on our own food, to exchange, to trade, to cook, and that's where we get into the packaging trap. You know, ready to eat meals, processed food that they can give us a bit of time back. The society store from us. Sure. Well, I drank up to uh, 2,000 bottles of soda stream. It emphatically did not save the planet. Uh, but the carbonic acid has worn down my teeth to be lumps of chalk, <laughs> uh, which means they're pretty useless for biting large animals, which raises the question, does meat have a place in a sustainable diet? Trigger warning here too. Now, here's a tip. Tip number 50, eat better meat. Here's a lovely picture from Chris Edzer about cutting up kangaroo and some friendly advice about cutting up crocodiles, which has to be from a farm. Don't go wrestling your own crocodiles, kids. It's against the law. We did speak to the urban wolf from his farm in Gippsland, Victoria. An interesting morning after an interesting night with uh, thunderstorms coming down, picked up another 30 metre rain. Now, I've just shared on my screen a um, picture of some food that you prepared. Do you want to just describe what we're looking at? Uh, it's a, a, a sourdough rye, uh, home pickled uh, olives. Then we go down the side, we have a slightly cured and then smoked uh, barramundi. Then okay. we have a cooked and then smoked or poached and smoked sausage uh, from the Harz Mountains as my mum comes from that area. And then we have a white and a black pudding. These, these, these two recipes are as, are as traditional as they can get. Okay. And then on the bottom, I have a little bit of bacon sliced up. Are the neighbouring farmers interested in what you're doing? Uh, they, they, they love it. They know if I make a bunch of sausages, they know I, I, I fling them around in the neighbourhood, they love it. Well, there we go, a man who flings his sausages around in the neighbourhood. Now, Lee Chantel, um, you've been talking to people about not eating meat. Here's a man who clearly loves his meat and believes in uh, using all the parts of the animal as much as he can. 
those sausages actually are made in the intestines of the animal, purely mm. scrubbed, I might add. Um, what do you say to, you know, farmers who live close to the land, close to their animals and, uh, you know, hand-preparing their animal-based products? Well, I won't talk about the physical or sexual elements because that's a whole other topic and different type of panel maybe, but um, it is interesting that um, wolf game is very um, focused on the community, so that's very interesting and working with the farmers. And there's things, you know, that I like to try and find things that I agree with with other people. So even though you might think, oh, this guy is, um, you know, killing animals and um, making a living from selling all that stuff might be diametrically opposed to a vegan, um, you know, you can find some stuff in common. And when I was reading um, his his stuff in your book, uh, Your Life, Your Planet, um, I realised that we did have some things in common. Like we don't agree with the mass manufacturing of animals and we agree that like highly processed food is not necessary and to um, consume more food that's in line with how our, parent, our grandparents ate. So that's really important. And I think um, there's some really good initiatives that um, vegan groups like the Vegan Society UK um, run something to work with farmers because farming is very intensive and a lot of a lot of farms are passed from generation to generation. And there's a lot of people sort of my age or younger that do not want to be in the industry anymore. It's hard work. And so how do we help those people who actually want to transition into something else? And there's a discussion there instead of saying you should be doing this and you should be doing that. Let's see where we can merge in the middle and find those people who want help to, to go towards something else. And I think that's a really good thing. And I'd just like to mention that, um, you know, veganism, a lot of people just think it's related to food. And food and environmental, you've mentioned quite a lot in your book because they're very, very important aspects of being vegan. Um, but there's so many other things that are, are related to it. So for me, um, and like your your daughter said in the book too, Tallulah, that, um, you know, veganism helps you become aware and make more um, conscious decisions and once you are aware of food processes or how animals are treated that can quite easily if you're willing and maybe open to go to other things like you know a social justice intersectionality like where other social justice areas um, meet oppression privilege um, some human and labour rights, um, feminism, and to me it also encompasses compassion towards not our um, non-human animal friends but also our, our human animal friends. And more effective communication too always helps. Excellent. Thank you. Now, one of the things that uh, Wolfgang grew up with was the advice of his uncle that we should only, uh, uh, if we only grew what, what we need or what we had to eat, then the world would be a much better place. But that goes to the systemic problems that we specialise and we're not all farmers. But yeah. do you want to pick up on that point? No, for sure. And so I, I can, so again, the problem is that we're producing things we don't need and, and that goes, you know, from uh, uh, electronic, electrical appliances, but it goes also in the food systems, you know. There's a big corporation are just producing junk food to increase their capital, not to feed or fulfill human needs. But And that's why, you know, the degrowth movement is calling for a contraction of the economy. But what does that mean? It means reducing, you know, the resources used and, and building human well-being, you know, beyond GDP, so the gross domestic product. But when we come back to food, um, unless we all grow all of the food we eat, we need someone else to grow the food for it. So isn't that the nub of the problem? Well, you know, the Degra movement is inviting to rethink society in the sense that obviously it's difficult, you know, to go back and grow each of us the food. And, if, and you know, with that also a, a, a problem is privilege. Not everyone has a land or a space. But that's where probably the concept of the commons comes in. You know, what if we recreate networks of uh, people that exchange or like a spare harvest or like community gardens, tool library, that's really 
we grew up in a very neoliberal society that you know thinks that we have to face um, all these problems so we as go individuals. Out and consume and we bring that yes, home exactly, and right? Eat it rather and, than making it ourselves and sharing. Yeah, and, and you know, for me, the the invite that they can give today is once you read this book, don't try to probably uh, do everything by yourself because it's going to be overwhelming. Because even if we are vegetarian or we are, you know, we are far from being perfect ourselves, and that's where the community as a change of uh, as agent change comes in. So I think, you know, I, I might invite people to read this book thinking, oh, what can I do in my private life? But what can I do with my neighbors, with my communities? Mm -hmm. And uh, so Degrow is really not about, and when I say the commons, it's not just about sharing things. It's about sharing responsibilities, you know. It's not about things. It's about the, yeah, it's a re-evaluation of, human relationships and how can that impact the macroeconomic system and i think it's really important because we do feel overwhelmed with all you know plus the pandemic <laughs> yeah well let's go to helen helen you've clearly thought about that kind of sharing community thing both with spare harvest and through your work in the circular economy so they're very important parts of this whole project A absolutely yeah. to um sabrina's point it's our collectiveness that is going to make an impact out there um so when we're talking about our specifically our food, we I've seen people try the experiments of trying to grow everything they want to eat. Mm -hmm. It's impossible to actually do because uh, we have a need for a varied diet um, and where our land is, our soils are all different, we'll grow different things and things like that. So what we need to do is we need to collectively grow for each other. So we need to get back to the way my grandparents, we they grew what they could in their on their farm or in their backyard or in their front yard on the verge those days. Mm -hmm. Um, and then we shared it with our neighbours and they shared what they could. Like, I can't grow carrots for love for money, but my kids love carrots. It's a staple in my house. If I had someone up the road growing carrots, I'd be quite happy to swap my abundance of cucumbers or my abundance of um. Well, I know a carrot grower who's got a kid who loves cucumbers. There so. you go. See, and that's the whole point, sort is of. finding those connections and actually matching them up, which is what Spare Harvest does, is find facilitate that matchmaking around food. So, and back to your, um, your plastic waste, just growing a herb in your garden stops you from going down the shop and buying herbs that are overpriced, mm -hmm. wrapped in single-use plastic, and then you end up, end up using about a third of the herb if you're lucky, and then it gets wasted and goes into the bin. Just grow a hay herb. Share it with your community. I share my lemongrass, my rosemary, my thyme and my oregano, my five and herb. I share that with my community so anyone can get fresh herbs any time of the day they like without having to buy it in single-use plastic. Can I add to that? We also need to reclaim spaces back and how yes. we design, you know, cities and areas, you know, mm -hmm. communal spaces. Centers. Because mm -hmm. if we don't have the land uh, to community for community garden stuff, then it's going to be actually difficult to implement. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, cities are interesting because they require a lot of steel. Twiggy Forest at the top of the show talked about manufacturing steel out of clean green um, hydrogen. Um, there are things that we do uh, consume as people. Uh, let's just have a listen to Eric Schultz talking about his consumption as an electric car owner and how he believes that is influencing uh, environmentalism. Or can. The cage. Lock yourself in. Well, Eric, we're in the cage, and the idea of the cage is we lock you in until you answer the question. And the question is always the same. What are you doing to contribute to a more sustainable world? So the reason we've in, uh, locked you in today is that uh, I understand that you're an electric car owner. I am an electric but, car owner. Yeah, so all the kids know about Teslas. I mean, this is the thing, walk, driving around in the car before they became more popular, where you'd be driving past people, it'd always be the kids that would point um, at the kids and go, look, look, wow, Dad, it's a Tesla. And yeah. uh, So, I mean, your love of your car and the enthusiasm that you speak of it mm. makes you somewhat of an ambassador. I, I think all Tesla drivers are ambassadors. We're, not we're notorious. <laughs> but it's let me have, it, it's let me have conversations with my conservative, you know, medical colleagues 
about this and then segueing into you know climate change and environmental issues and it just it it makes the whole movement to sustainability and addressing climate change seem less about pedaling a bicycle uphill and eating mung beans and more about just being smart um, and using smart technology and, and and, Interesting, you know, and, yeah. and moving forward with technology, and, and people will engage with that. People who won't engage with the push bike and mung bean conversation, who just who just can't go there emotionally, are m much more happy to engage. Yeah, as a, as a doctor, I've seen firsthand, experienced firsthand, the difficulty of getting people to change their lifestyle for their own personal benefit, and. Yeah, I can tell you. So uh, you mean you're giving people medical advice? And yeah, find you know, it difficult lose to... weight, get more exercise, stop smoking, drink less, eat healthily. <laughs> you know what I'm doing. And <laughs> you know, this is fairly simple stuff that people need to do for their own benefit. People cannot and will not do it. The vast bulk of the population struggles enormously to make sacrifices. And so, is that just um, instant gratification? Is that that we just love yeah, pleasure? Yeah, and some people can do it. Um, yeah, and there's a bell curve with this, and you've got extremes at, at both ends of the bell curve. But for the people at the the people at that dedicated, forward-thinking end of the bell curve, to be shouting at the rest of the bell curve, yeah. <laughs> come and going? come and think about the future like we do. Yeah, that's you know, oh. as a as a doctor who's had those conversations, I'm very nihilistic about them. I, I'm you know, you know, very you know, I really pessimistic. I don't think. That will ever happen. That won't be the thing that saves us. So even being admonished by Eric could not stop me writing about mung beans or bikes. Uh, but he does have a point, doesn't he, Sabrina? I, I honestly disagree a little bit because uh, yeah, the electric car, um, you know, uh, move, like technology has been studied and there's something called the Jevon paradox or the rebound effect showing that, you know, living and not changing our values and how society is structured, it's going to cost us less to drive this car, so we're going to drive more. So, you know, we're going to end up with the same resource use, uh, we're going to end up with the same problem of congestion, you know, and, and so on. So I invite everyone to read about the Jevon paradox, which is an electrical car. And again, is a very technology-driven capitalistic solution that doesn't Think, doesn't push us to think collectively. So would you say the same thing about Twiggy's clean green hydrogen and um, manufacturing steel from renewable energy? Uh, I think, you know, even the renewable energy problem is that we, we think we need renewable energy. Yes, we do, but I want to invite people to think what do we need energy for, you know, because mm -hmm. even if we uh, uh, shift completely to renewable energy, we can have solar panel on every square meters of the planet. But if we keep up this production and, you know, this productivist and consumerist system, then that won't be enough, you know. So we need to understand what are we producing for, for who, how this uh, wealth brought by technology is distributed, because obviously buying a Tesla is a very highly privileged option that not everyone has. So I think, you know, you, we can't have ecological sustainability without social I justice. I haven't seen any Teslas on uh the spare harvest, Helen. <laughs> no, definitely, definitely not. I don't think you'd see many um, Teslas where I live at the moment. Um, <laughs> it's about local. I mean, having an electric car to travel longer distances and thinking you're making an in, a, a positive impact is, is absolutely ridiculous. As um, Sabrina said, if we want to, we need to rethink why we're using our cars, why are we purchasing our cars. We need to be back in that mindful situation and go, how often am I going to use the car? Um, Cities now have shared cars. They even have parking spaces dedicated to share cars. So you can actually just book the car for an hour or, an, or half an hour. There's platforms out there like Spare Harvest specifically for share, sharing cars. I think we need to get back to and actually have a look at the resources that we already are existing, which is the fundamentals of the circular economy. Look at what already exists and how we can more efficiently use it so it never becomes waste and stop bringing virgin inputs into our economy that will actually end up being wasted. And invest in public transport. <laughs> okay, well, look, thanks to the clock, that's it for this episode of The Generator. This show's focus has been about the new book, Your Life, Your Planet, which would not have been possible without this wonderful team of eco-warriors. Thank you, Helen. Sabrina and Lee Chantel, and our fact checker and producer behind the camera today, 
Marcella Remarez. Uh, you can find out more about the book or buy a copy from me at the yourlifeyourplanet.com or if you've been that way, hashtag YLYP.